this episode of Voice of the Sea, we're in the upper forests of East Maui in the Nakula Natural Area Reserve, working with the Maui Forest Bird Recovery Project to help restore the native Hawaiian forest as part of their mission to save nearly extinct birds like the Kiwi Q, whose population has plummeted to less than 300 individuals. We'll track birds, plant trees, and learn about the forest and the Kiwi Q. We start off with native plant expert, Michelle Smith, who shows us some of the 300 plants we'll be bringing to Nakula. We are at Maui Native Nursery in Kula, Maui. We grow all native Hawaiian plants for restoration across the state. We are in Kula, but we're, we're in kind of like lower Kula, we're only about a thousand feet or so. It's hot here. And so it's actually a great place to harden these off and give them a nice strong sun so that when they go out into the field, they don't get sunburned, they don't get drought, stress, anything like that. And tell me a little bit about the plants that you have here. These plants are plants that are specific for Nakula Natural Area Reserve, which is where Maui Forest Bird Recovery Project is doing restoration. They go out into the field and they collect local specific seed for us. And then we clean it and we sow some of it and we store some of it so that we can sow it later so that we can stagger the propagation. What do you mean by cleaning the seed? Most plants will make either a berry like this. This is olapa. So they'll make a berry or they'll make a dry seed capsule. So this is a'ali'i. And we have to separate the seed chaff or the berry flesh from the seed before we sow it. This is how we get a'ali'i from Nakula. It's all in the seed husk. And then we clean it all out so that we get individual a'ali'i seed, which is the black. Mm -hmm. And then we sow it and six months later, we get an ali tree. This is actually sort of how we clean it, only we use a weed whacker. In a True weed, story. Weed whacker in the bucket. Yeah, so we put the seed in a bucket and we agitate it all up and then the chaff flies away and you end up with clean a'ali'i seed. And this is all Nakula specific oh. a'ali'i seed. So when we sow this and make plants, um, we label them all so we know exactly where the seed came from. In this particular flat, we have the Hawaiian holly. We also have ohia, which is one of the two dominant forest trees in Hawaii. This is ohia seed. Ohia is a very fine seed. You can see it through the glass on the bottom. It's wind dispersed seed. It's very small. So these are ohia seedlings. And we have Dubaudia, which is a genus that was native collected in Nakula and Ohe and A'ali'i. This is the primary restoration tree for a lot of Hawaii. It's a dry forest tree, it's drought tolerant, it's wind tolerant, it's pretty much all elevation and it just is kind of a warrior. So a lot of the groups use a lot of A'ali'i, especially to start. And then they'll kind of fill in with diversity as the forest starts to mature. The a'ali'i drops a lot of leaf litter and kind of creates its own soil and its own shade. So that's kind of why they start with those particular species in order to kind of establish a site and then they'll go in and add the more delicate things. One of the main threats to the native forest, specifically the native plants, is invasive ungulates. Most of the places where these plants are being planted for restoration are fenced, including this nursery. This nursery couldn't be here if it wasn't ungulate fenced. So we are surrounded by an eight foot fence. If this tree were to be planted in an unfenced location, they would just cut it right in half. They actually have very high survivability rate in restoration areas where they are protected. A lot of the habitats right now are so degraded that a lot of the trees that used to be there aren't there anymore so they can't actually even get site-specific seed. But they'll look at a lot of like habitat areas and then they'll also look in like the historical bank, um, historical record, things like that in order to figure out what kind of diversity they can introduce so that it's not just a single koa stand or something like that. So oftentimes gulches are a more intact ecosystem because it was harder for the animals to get down there. So a lot of times it's the gulches is where you get a lot of your seed and stuff. So when we're going seed collecting in the gulches, you can just find plants that 
you never knew were there or ones that are just very important to the ecosystem. You can also plant more sensitive plants in the gulches because there's more water and more protection. And so the site itself is just a pretty magical place, especially to see the recruitment just after ungulates were removed and the difference in just the cakey plants everywhere that you didn't even put there. I have volunteered for multiple years out at Nakula. It is really exciting to go back to the test plots and you're like, wow, I planted this five years ago. And a lot of the trees are huge and they've got nice big trunks and they're really solid. Coming up, we'll take the native plants up to Nakula for planting with the Maui Forest Bird Recovery Project team. University of Hawaii Sea Grant College program focused on Hawaii's coasts and its communities through sustainable development, safe seafood supply, sustainable coastal tourism, hazard resilience, and healthy coastal ecosystems. Hawaii Sea Grant. Welcome back. We're heading up 5,000 feet to the Nakula Field Station to help with forest restoration and talk story with Hannah Mounts and Chris Warren from the Maui Forest Bird Recovery Project about the upcoming Kiwi Q release into the wild. Everything is centered here. All the tents and everybody's living is all around here. We try to stick to trails to limit trails that we've made, but to limit impact between all the spots. We fly out compost, we fly out garbage, and we have a composting toilet system here that all goes out and gets composted at our office. We don't dig holes. We don't leave anything here. This 420 acre area was fenced first, so this is where we started. It's part of a much bigger picture. There's partners planting to the east and the west and fencing to the east and the west, but this is kind of the core where we're starting with. Maui Forest Bird Recovery Project started in 1997. We're a habitat restoration and endangered species recovery project. We were founded to basically investigate what's going on with the clients and forest birds here. We worked on trying to recover the po'uli, which was the most recent extinction on Maui. And now we focus on recovering the next most endangered bird on Maui, which is the Kiwi Kiu. The Kiwi Kiu right now is restricted to the windward slope. They're in about 30 to 40 square kilometers, and there just isn't enough habitat for them over there. They're already protected. They don't do well in the episodes of heavy rain. There isn't more we can do on that side right now with the tools we have to create more birds. So instead, we're trying to build new habitat for them on this side of the mountain. And so we're putting the trees back to rebuild this forest, and then we're gonna bring the birds from the windward side of the mountain over here. This was a mixed koa ohia forest. Where the birds are currently is only ohia forest. So the birds we bring over will never have seen koa before, which is interesting. This is like the mesic forest. So it's funny, we're sitting in clouds right now, um, but it, it's the drier side because they're in super heavy wet rain on the windward side. We're at about 5,100 feet in elevation. We're kind of just into the zone where we can get some disease refugia, not as many mosquitoes. Mosquitoes carry avian malaria and avian malaria can live in the non-native birds just fine. We've got you know, a disease and a vector that our native species were naive to and really sensitive to. It's, you know, it's very similar when you study indigenous cultures and you know, Europeans, we bring in diseases that they aren't familiar with. We did the exact same thing with birds and it can basically wipe out a lot of species really quickly. We bring up volunteers every time we come up here. I have a very small staff. At least half of all of our trips are volunteers. People can come out and camp with us for a week. They're gonna work their booties off, just like our staff. We always need gear. We always need help with all the logistics out of the field. People can sponsor trees. We have all kinds of people who have sponsored trees in memory of other people to do their own personal carbon offsets, like whatever, any ways to get more trees in the ground up here. And even like, the average tourist who's traveling to Maui can even donate us Hawaiian Airlines miles to offset other costs for the project. 
our goals for this week are quite, quite a few different things. We've got 300 plants to put in the ground, small mammal trapping to remove any of the small mammals that are in this area in preparation for the release. We've also got some birds to track. We've got radio transmitters on some Hawaiian amakihi, and we're doing that to see how the terrain is for tracking using radio telemetry. And so we've got to locate those eight birds and see what they're up to tomorrow as well. And then those are the same kind of transmitters we're going to use on the KiwiQ when they're released out here. Next, we've hiked for about 45 minutes from the camp to the planting site, where we'll put 300 plants from Native Nursery in the ground. This one's a really cool one. This is Kava'u, Native Holly. It is a KiwiQ food plant. It tends to really be most common in diverse forests, so this is one that we're adding diversity back in. Pilo, we have planted a lot of pilo, in part because it's easy to get a lot of berries from it, but it's also, it's a kiwiQ food plant. It's one of the few native trees that kiwiQ will actually eat the fruit of rather than just eating insects out of the fruit. We have Dubaudia plantaginea, or nainae. This is in the Silver Sword Alliance, so it's a, it's a cool native aster. There are some Dubaudia for, sort of from Maoka to Makai. The ones way at the top are adapted to this you know, very cold climate, so they've almost got these succulent leaves. Down here, they're much bigger, thin uh, leaves, and uh, they become small trees or large shrubs. Really hairy. Yeah, yeah, and they're all really fuzzy, and some of them almost appear silver because of that. And Ohe Mauka, this was a tree there were no more of in Nakula, and this is the first year we've planted these. We've done a couple hundred of them now. They grow really quickly and they become giant trees, so I'm excited about them. So we have Ohia, which is probably the most important tree species in Hawaiian rainforests. On the windward side, it makes up more than 90% of the trees. Here it's about 50% of the trees. Uh, along with koa. It's an important nesting tree and a really important nectar source for a lot of honey creepers. QEQ nests have only ever been found in Ohia. They may nest in koa now that there's more of them here, but we'll find that out. We have a'ali'i, which is a really important pioneer species. A lot of the natural regeneration we have seen here is a'ali'i. They produce a lot of seed, a lot of leaves, which is really important for shading out the invasive grasses, which really hurt germination. We're a little bit harsh on them. You know, we don't, we're not going to water them. We're not going to give them fertilizer. They are out on their own. We've got pretty high survivorship, which was something that we didn't know what was going to happen when we started this project. And now we know that for the most part, I mean, some of these species are a little bit new to us and they kind of remain untested, but Ali'i, Pilo, Ohia, they just grow. From here now, we're gonna go out and actually stick these in the ground. That's right, yeah, we got some holes to dig. Usually one auger can stay ahead of five or six people planting. So you were saying that the Maui Forest Bird Group has planted about 6,500 plants? Uh, 10 times that, 65,000. Oh. <laughs> um, yeah, we, uh, we started kind of small doing this restoration experiment because we didn't know if we planted trees how they would do. And the experiment, you know, it turned out well in some respects, but in other respects we didn't learn a ton because everything survived. We didn't learn a lot about how best to plant. Some of the things we know is like applying herbicide ahead of time to reduce the grass so that reduces the competition that your seedlings wind up having. We're planning on releasing KiwiQ here. This area is just a small area. This is the release site. The slope has the habitat for the birds. I mean, KiwiQ will not be saved just by keeping them in Nakula. The Natural Area Reserve Group has planted a ton of plants, way more than us, or to the east of here. And then to the west of here, other partners have done even more. Slope-wide, we have collectively planted over 250,000. All around this slope, 
all the, the remaining forest is being fenced and restored. And to the west of us there, it's a huge chunk, but it will be among the last to be fenced. Um, and that's happening this year, I think. So it's very exciting. Awesome. Yeah. Coming up, we'll find out more about the Maui Forest Bird Recovery Project's plans for the Kiwi Q. We are looking for a few heroes, mentors, trailblazers, innovators, a passion to change lives, spark curiosity, open hearts, and awaken minds, help students answer the question, who am I? This could be your calling, but this is no job. It's the journey of a lifetime. Be a hero. Be a teacher. Welcome back to Voice of the Sea. We're camping with the Maui Forest Bird Recovery Project team at their field site in the Nakula Natural Area Reserve on Maui talking to avian conservation expert Chris Warren to learn more about the Kiwi Q and the plans for its release. The Hawaiian honey creepers, as you may know, they're actually finches, right? So they came here, they diversified through a process called adaptive radiation, and some of them became insectivores, some became nectivores, some became frugivores, and Kiwi Q are insectivores, so they've got this bizarre bill, which is, seems oversized for their tiny bodies. And they use that to rip into bark and to extract insects from under the bark, inside little sticks, from inside fruits. It's really, it's, it's pretty amazing to watch them forage. In some ways, they kind of fulfill a woodpecker type role. In other ways, they're just their own thing and no other honey creeper is like them, and they're only found on Maui. Uh, they once were on Molokai, we know that. They seem like they really require native forest. Even in the non-native forest that kind of borders their range, they don't seem to utilize it at all. They lay one egg at a time, and that chick then would stay with the parents for a very long time at least six months, and then the parents would feed the chick for up to 18 months after. Unfortunately, that makes them pretty hard to save. For a long time, these birds we thought were about stable than only 500 birds. Now the population estimates seem to be declining very rapidly. The latest estimate, the most birds there could have been was 300. Before, the fewest birds we thought were about 300. We know that they're declining where they are right now. If we choose to not do something like this and choose to do nothing and just leave them be, we are very likely to see their extinction quickly. We think that we can fit somewhere between probably 10 and 20 pairs in this area. Slope wide, we're hoping for somewhere between 100 and 200 pairs, but we don't know. It might be that the carrying capacity now is smaller, but then as these areas are rest being restored and uh, regenerating on their own, then the carry carrying capacity slowly increases. One of the things we're gonna have to do, or we'd really like to do, is track the birds once they're released. And to do that, we add these tiny, teeny tiny little radio transmitters to them. They're just temporarily there, like on a little backpack. And then we use this setup. We have an antenna and a digital receiver. And so those tiny little transmitters on their backs have a battery and a teeny tiny computer board. And all they do is send out a signal at a, a radio signal at a specific frequency. Mm -hmm. And then we use this to track them down. And then when we find them, then we can take more detailed behavioral observations and things like that. I just took a GPS waypoint. Um, so even though I didn't see him, it's one of the nice things about the telemetry is you, if the signal is strong enough in one tree, and then it vanishes. You know that he was there. So yeah, we 
you take a collection of all these waypoints and you map it out and you can use certain programs to visualize their home range. I doubt we'll be able to see them in this fog. Oh, it's right there though. I saw an Amakihi move right where the signal was super strong. But it, he's moving around in that Ohia. That's strong. It's not, it's not as strong as I would expect if he was right here. And then you guys are also use the bird banding on their legs to identify individuals? Yes, exactly. So each bird has a unique combination of color bands on their legs. And they're very tiny, very light bands. And so when we see the bird, ideally, we can see all four colors and we know who that is. Some of the birds are captive reared birds and so they have never been in the wild, so that will be interesting to see how they're interacting in an open space. The wild translocated birds are used to a different forest. There's a whole lot more koa here, very little koa over there, and historically we think that that was an important species. Your site here at Nakula is called Camp Release, and yeah. the main objective, all the plants that you're planting, the work that you guys have been doing is in preparation for this upcoming release of the QVQ. Can you kind of talk me through the process? What will the aviaries be like? What will that moment <laughs> the release? <laughs> yeah, so some of the birds will be captive. There's have been a captive breeding program since the 90s. That breeding is run by the San Diego Zoo Global. We are gonna be taking just about all of the captive birds that are uh, releasable and releasing them here. There's going to be only eight of them initially, the captive birds, and then we, what we would like is to release 20 individuals. So the remaining 12 would come from Hanavi Natural Area Reserve, and we'll have them in small aviaries temporarily as we're, as we're capturing. Every QBQ that's been brought into captivity because it was injured or for the breeding program, they have always taken to captivity actually quite well. So we're not too worried about that part of it. Once the doors are opened, that food will still be provided for them. And so that's a supplementary feeding. It's another way of anchoring them to the site, but it's also a way of sort of ensuring if for some reason they're not be able to find enough food out on their own, that they will still have food there. The sad reality is not all the birds are probably going to make it. 20 birds is not very big to start a whole population. This size area can probably support the number of birds that we're releasing. Some of the neighboring forest area may also be good habitat. So yeah. is it possible that they'll leave Nakula and Absolutely. live and I, nearby? Yeah. And honestly, in the end, we need them to leave Nakula. I mean, <laughs> it, it would be great if they went over here and set up a home range over here and started breeding because then we've got our aviaries all set up here and we can <laughs> release more birds right here. This is risky, certainly risky to the individual birds, but it's really important for the species. We're kind of down to the wire. We've lost dozens of species actually and there are quite a few like QBQ that are declining rapidly, both on Maui and the other main islands. We need to be bold. We've been putting up fences, we've protect, been protecting the forest, all excellent things. We're still losing them. It's not enough. We need to do more. This is super, super important. The QEQ release of November 2019 will introduce these birds back into the Mezic Forest where they were once found. Follow the research online and join us in a future episode to find out how the QEQ takes to its restored Nakula habitat. Mahalo for watching Voice of the Sea.